Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Ticket Tuesday webinar. I'm Liz Downing, Senior Manager of Partnerships and Events at Ticketmetrics. We are an advertising optimization superpower in the e commerce space. I have got my good friend with me today. He is the CEO and co founder, of, or just founder. Are you founder or co founder? Uh, we're co founder now. So. <laughs> I think maybe the first webinar we did together was different, but um, <clears throat> this is Sajag, everybody. He has been in the space for how many how many years now? Uh, so in the Amazon space, I have probably been here for almost ten years now. Uh, so it's been a pretty 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 good minute. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna want you to give everybody a little bit of your background because it's fascinating. But first, I'm gonna say the stuff I always say to you lovely attendees who are joining us live today, please ask questions in the question section of GoToWebinar. And yes, the session is being recorded. So um, you will get the recording after, but that doesn't mean you should drop off because you have a chance to ask questions live. And we've got a lot of good information for you today. So, um, all that going through, I'm going to open the question section. So if anybody's got questions, how long will be this webinar? This webinar will be about 45 to 50 minutes, depending on how many questions y'all have. So, um, just hang in there, hold on, hold on to your hat because we'll go pretty quick. We don't have slides. We're just going to talk. So we want you to be part of the conversation too. So pop your questions in and, um, use the question section, not the chat if you would because I can't have both windows open at the same time. I mean, I can, but I can't keep up with both things. I'm not a very smart bear. Anyway, let's hear a little bit about your background and how you got into the e-commerce space and why you created Mobley. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, before I get, get dive in, I just wanna apologize about my background. I'm actually in an Airbnb right now in San Francisco. So I apologize, it's a little, it's very messy. It didn't look like this in the photos. But uh, anyways, um, so yeah, a little bit about me. So I'm Sajuk. Uh, I am the founder, co-founder of Mobley and CEO. Uh, we do quality control inspections in China, India, Vietnam to make sure your products are good and protect the reviews on an ongoing basis. Uh, to give you some context on a little bit about my background. So I originally started as a seller. And uh, so a few years ago, I built a few brands actually. I built a brand initially on eBay. And uh, that worked out pretty well for me. And uh, afterwards, I went and built a brand called Side. Uh, we were in the self and accessories, consumer electronics space. Uh, ended up growing that brand to a little over two million a year in revenue. Uh, but as we started building the brand, we started having a lot of quality control problems. Uh, we started having products that were breaking apart easily or missing components, the wrong colors, things like that. Um, all the way from like you know small stuff like you know cell phone cases, all the way down to like more electronic products, and uh, kind of saw the whole gambit of issues um, and it actually got so bad to the point where it was getting a it was becoming a business critical issue for us so a lot of people don't really i'm sure like as an amazon seller you've kind of seen this but the the numbers to quantify it is like typically if you lose about half a star on amazon so say you go from 4.5 to 4 you will lose maybe around 20 to 30 percent of your sales just because amazon is just so competitive and if you lose one star you'll lose you know, 70%. We actually had a customer reached out to us and he lost almost 100% of his sales just losing one star in his product because it was just such a competitive category. And uh, that kind of stuff like happens all the time and it was starting to happen to us and we were starting to see some of the potential sales damage and uh, became a business critical issue. So I ended up moving to Shenzhen, China and basically lived there for a year uh, doing my own inspections, doing my own QC, going to all the factories, went to hundreds of factories, saw the ins and outs of the manufacturing process, and uh, kind of just realized how archaic it was, especially when it came to inspections. A lot of my inspections were you know, getting passed. We were doing them on every order, and they were not, uh, uh, you know, we were still getting defective products, and you know, started to kind of realize why that was happening. You literally have an inspector going to your factory, checking things on a clipboard, and you have no visibility into what they're doing, what, you know, what time they got there, what time they stopped, what time they started. And then uh, you get this report and it's like, yeah, everything looks good, but you don't even know what they tested. They don't even know your product. They don't even ask you questions about your product to be able to know what, how to properly look at it. So uh, it just was altogether a, a very terrible process. And that's actually what led me into founding and building Mobley. Um, and that's what we do today. So did y'all hear that? He was having trouble with his product. So he moved to China to fix it. 
that is dedication. And he, what he learned there is what has formed this company that he created. And that is that Mavli does this work for you. So they talk to your factories, they convey any concerns you have about your product, your product quality, so that you don't have to move to China yourself. If you don't want to, if you want to, go ahead. But um, so. Google is, I, I recommend it. <laughs> um, so I've, I've always meant to ask you this, and I don't think I ever have. What in, in all this that you've learned, right? Working with factories, um, examining product reviews, is there anything that you could have seen if you had known more when you were selling? Is there anything you could have done to avoid a drastic life change, move to another country, live there for a year and fix this problem yourself? Is there anything, were there any red flags that you missed that we could share with the crowd here so that they know if they've got one of these red flags, they need to take action right away? Yeah, so it's uh, it's actually, it's really interesting. So a lot of times, I think the one of the biggest lessons that I learned and, you know, looking at, uh, you know, going to hundreds of factories, um, talking with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of sellers and other manufacturers and people in supply chain, and really kind of understanding the ins and outs of manufacturing and how that whole thing works. Um, I think one of the biggest learnings that I had and um, is that you might have good relationships with your suppliers. Uh, but good relationships don't ultimately mean that like things are going to be consistent. You're going to have good quality. And uh, a lot of people fall into this like mistake of thinking, you know, hey, I have good relationships with my suppliers, so everything's going to be fine for the next 10 years, right? And at the end of the day, suppliers are people. They're not like, you know, they're always changing. They're improving or they're, you know, getting worse. They're hiring people. They're firing people. They're businesses, you know? And, um, you know, if you typical supplier, like in manufacturing, it's very human intensive. So you are working with like, you know, a small factory can still have like 50 people working on the production lines, you know, and there's quality engineers, there's production line managers, there's raw material managers, there's a guy who inspects the raw materials, there's a guy who, uh, you know, orders the raw materials, the guy who orders the raw materials changes, and he starts ordering from his other friend, uh, because he got a new hire, then, you know, the quality of the output changes. And, uh, you know, even the people on the production line and the guys setting up your product, when you say, hey, I want, you know, the same thing I want last time, your sales guy is like, yeah, sounds good. I'm going to do the same invoice line item. But when it gets to your production manager, the production manager might be different or the worker might be different. So the, the cool thing about good relationships is, is obviously very important, uh, but it essentially means that your supplier will take accountability when issues go wrong by fixing them. So they'll be like, hey, guys sorry you you ran into some problems you know we'll credit you on the next order we'll you know we'll fix it on this order because you caught it before we shipped or whatever but that's not going to stop permanent damage you know they're not going to pay for like hey my reviews you know went down one star and i lost 70 percent of my sales that's not what good supplier relationships are going to really stop um so it's, it's difficult i mean there's a lot of things you can do when you know obviously going and looking at factories to prevent a lot of those issues and uh you know we can obviously dive into that and that that'll be a pretty long conversation uh, but I think, um, you know, uh, you know, focus more on the review side. Like, I think, you know, the the big kind of thing is that a lot of like supply chain in, in general, when you like look at like sourcing from China and a lot of these supply chain like blogs and tips and tricks and things like that, before Amazon and like online reviews, you could mess up an order and uh, you will lose money on that order. It'll probably cost you, but, you know, you're not going to suffer like permanent damage, uh, you know, but like now with online reviews, you are actually risking your brand. So it's something that like you as an e-commerce manager or you as a brand owner have to be on top of. And uh, now supply chain is more connected than ever into you know how you construct your products, how you build your products, the features that you prioritize in your products and how you monitor that. You know, a lot of people get into this loop where they're just like, yeah, like everything's going great. So let's keep doing what we're doing. Uh, but that doesn't work. And, you know, when you're managing e-commerce and you're selling on Amazon in such a competitive marketplace, you have to stay on top of it and you have to consistently improve. And uh, that's where, you know, reviews are a fantastic tool to do that. So I have a lot of tips and tricks on how we can set that up. Well, so, you know, when you met me for the very first time, I used to travel the land talking about how to get product reviews in a way that did not make Amazon angry with you. So I have a, I still have a particular interest 
in that topic. Um, but I've always advocated using reviews to improve your products, to improve your business processes, to improve, I mean, that's your greatest source of information, right? Is the reviews that people yeah. leave on your products provided yeah. that you're getting reviews. So that's a whole different conversation, how to get more reviews. We have an old webinar on that if you want to watch it. I'll put a link in the show notes. But um, so talk to me about that. So can you point out, do you have a story, like a review that you had on one of your products that led you to the path of talking to your supplier, to your manufacturer? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, it's really interesting. So we um, so when you look at reviews, right? Like um, there, it's very easy and obvious. You know, start with the negative reviews. Like so for me, right? We started having a lot of negative reviews that came in. Or like, okay, hey, you have problem A, you have problem B, you have problem C. It's like I'm having this issue, I'm having this issue. Okay, awesome. So you know, pull up a Google Sheets, start making a list of all the issues, start tabulating. You know, hey, I'm having one of these issues, two of these issues, three of these issues, or whatever. Or, you know, put it in Word somewhere, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but you want to make sure you keep track of the negative issues. Those are the most obvious. Um, I think another thing also is like look at competitor listings, right? Like take a look at competitors of similar products in your industry, find the negative reviews that, you know, apply to that product and, you know, with other competitors, because when things go wrong, you'll see what goes wrong in those kind of products and that'll help you inform what you need to look for in your product. Uh, but one of the things that a lot of sellers really forget is you also need to look at positive reviews. Um, so I'll give you an example, like, um, you know, one of my, um, uh, one of the customers we spoke with, right, he was having a lot of issues with his keychains. He sells keychains on Amazon. He actually, as a side note, his supplier mislabeled the products on one of his shipments. They put the wrong UPC code on it. And uh, as a result, um, his inbound privilege, uh, like inbound privileges almost got suspended on Amazon when the shipment was received. Um, but, uh, so like even little things can make a huge difference, but when it comes down to like making sure that, uh, you know, you're looking at good reviews, he had people all the time, you know, saying, Hey, five stars product was great, but by the way, I was missing a component, but it's okay. It's uh, I got the main product or whatever. Right. And, uh, so it's very important to actually look into the good reviews and actually figure out, you know, a, what is driving the most positive reviews, right? Like, is there a feature, you know, it's like, uh, for example, like, the size is perfect or hey this you know it's a food product the taste is amazing you know the texture is fantastic it feels like high quality leather whatever right like all those aspects are positive traits and you want to make sure you're keeping track of those and what are the biggest reasons where you know customers are buying your products it's great for marketing i'm sure liz you would love this like it's absolutely amazing for marketing right like you know now what the most the most important things your customers care about you can put them into your bullets or put them into your listing images and things like that uh, but also on a second point, right, it also tells you, hey, you know, these are the areas that I should really be paying attention to. And uh, these are the areas that, you know, I should be telling my supplier and reinforcing as well. Because what's really important is that you don't just reinforce like, hey, supplier, you screwed up on problem A and you need to fix problem A without telling them, hey, by the way, supplier, problem A was really good. Um, you know, problem A is a problem. Let's fix that. But also, by the way, we had a lot of customers compliment this feature, this feature, this feature keep up the good work, you know, so then the supplier's not like, oh, they care about this, but they don't really care about the quality of the leather, right, or whatever. So it's important that you take a look at what's working and also what's not working and use that to create a comprehensive um, overview of what needs to improve or stay the same in the product. And actually, um, Liz, we have a really cool tool for this. I don't know if we can shoot a link to this. Yeah. Believe can you get into the chat? Uh, you probably can't. So chat it over to me and I'll chat it out to everyone. Yeah, let me um, do that. Cool, I just shot over a link. Uh, but this is actually a super cool tool and uh, we actually just built it last week. And uh, you just basically drop in any product ASIN and it basically goes through the latest five pages of reviews. So it goes through about 50 to 100 reviews depending on how long the reviews are. And uh, it'll actually analyze all the reviews just like you read them and list out like, hey, you know, these are the most common problems with your product from the good reviews and from the bad reviews. So you can kind of see where customers are complaining. Um, so highly recommend checking that out. It's actually, I ran it on a few of my products initially and like a few other products from customers. And 
when we first saw the results that came in, we were like actually shocked. Like I go through and like, you know, like when, you know, for example, we, you know, I take a look at a customer's product, for example, and look through the reviews, I get a pretty good idea, but then, you know, I run it through this tool and I'm just like, wait a minute, like there's actually so much more information here that I didn't even realize. And you don't really get that level of information unless you take the time and literally read through like 50 reviews. That's so cool that you made that because we did just get a question about what chat GBT extension do you do to do review analysis and turns out you you made one instead. Yep. So um, we talk a lot about customer sentiment because obviously brands want user generated content so that they get that positive customer sentiment but to be able to go through real reviews, real customer reviews on your products and see common keywords that are used to see, I mean, that helps with your advertising too, you know? Um, and it helps you with listing optimization. But let's talk particularly about, I like real life examples. So since you started Mobley, what sorts of, give me some examples of some problems that you guys have identified and solved for some of the brands that you've worked with? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's obviously like yeah, a very- say names, but just like type of product category, you know, like was it the wrong color? Did it explode, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's a pretty broad range. Um, we've seen like all the way from like really simple problems all the way down to very complex problems. Um, so there's like a pretty broad range, like on the most simple side, uh, we've seen issues where like the UPC code is wrong, like the products are mislabeled. So what ends up happening is that, you know, say you have like five variations and your supplier accidentally, you know, puts some UPC codes from variation A on variation B or it gets mislabeled in the production line because, you know, someone wasn't paying attention. And what ends up happening is you start getting a lot of negative reviews that say, hey, I ordered, you know, the black and I got the gray and, you know, and you get a negative review on that. And so that ends up becoming a huge issue and something that's easily avoidable. Um, there's, you know, issues of, of course on the wrong color. Uh, there's issues as far as like how the, you know, the packaging is broken, things like that, where, you know, it's like, wow, my packaging wasn't, you know, put together properly and it actually failed a drop test. So by the time it got to, uh, you know, where it needed to go, it was all broken. So, you know, that's more on the simple side. Uh, the more complex side, I mean, we've had issues with like, you know, wear and tear, like products are breaking a lot faster than they're supposed to and they're falling apart. Um, so we had a customer actually in the toys um, section and it was like a toy ball. And uh, he actually ended up um, losing one star on his product. And uh, he's the one who went, he was selling 300 units a day of this toy ball and uh, went down to five units a day just because he lost one star, uh, just given toys is so competitive had to actually relaunch his entire product uh, to get it back up to 300 stars after he started working with us. Or five and stars. why didn't you lose that star? Uh, just to actually, just the product was just breaking apart. And it's like a toy ball, you know, you'd never think like, wow, you know, it's like, this is gonna break, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, as, as he said, like, it's the most simple toy ever. Like, he grew up with it. Like, I don't understand, like, what could have went wrong? And uh, initially it was fine, uh, the first order, and then, you know, sold it and then the second order came in it wasn't good and uh third order came in and it wasn't good again and you know just like started dropping in stars but basically what ended up happening is customers would buy the product and they'd say hey this is supposed to last for you know at least a few months right like you're you're sending it to you know your your kid to play with and it's like breaking apart in a few days so there were a lot of negative reviews from that and that's actually something that i had with my product as well like a lot of times, uh, another thing that uh, sellers forget is uh, warranties, you know, it, you can't be competitive if you don't give a warranty on your product. Like a lot of products and a lot of industries, you know, you, that warranty is like actually part of your selling prop. You know, you put it in your A plus description, you say, you know, hey, by the way, we have a one year warranty or whatever. Right. And that's just like standard for a lot of products and a lot of industries. So if you have a warranty, what ends up happening is it's even worse because customers will reach out to you six months later and they'll be like, hey, by the way, my product broke what are you going to do about it and then you have to actually replace it and fix it for that so we actually had that issue with some of our products where you know they were fine for the first two three weeks four weeks five weeks past the return window uh, but then they started breaking on you know month two month three sometimes month eight month nine month 12 and uh, you know customers reach out to us and you know if we didn't have uh, a solution for them then they would leave a negative review
uh, 10 months out. So it's, um, that's also a huge, huge consideration. I think you helped someone I know with their manufacturer was using a different material for a, a product that was supposed to be a certain color. And all of a sudden it wasn't the same color as it used to be. So it wasn't as described. So they were getting like complaints, like product is not as described and all of their product reviews were like, it's purple, not red, or it's red, not purple. I can't remember which way it went, but it was something like that. But that can happen too. If you're far, far away from where your product is being made and you don't have product quality assessment in place, then you're flying blind, really. And we've all been doing it for a lot of years, right? But just like you said, competition is getting even more intense on Amazon especially. You're competing with Amazon themselves. You're competing with great, great big brands. You're competing with brand new brands and brand new sellers. And you're competing with people that are jumping on your listings and hijacking them. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. The last thing you need is for your product to not be the product that you're paying to get produced. And that's my yeah. sub-bar today. No, actually, Liz, that's a really good point you brought up. I actually um, forgot this example, but um, colors, color consistency is a huge issue uh, between orders. And um, that's actually, you know, like you have a factory, right? Like the guy running the production line, you know, the raw materials and stuff is often different from your sales guy. You know, there's rotations, things like that. But um, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that um, this actually happened with um, uh, one of the customers we spoke with where um, he was actually ordering from a supplier for seven years. Um, he wasn't engaged in regular inspections on his products and um, he had no problem for seven years. And on his seventh year, his supplier changed the material of, he did travel bags, uh, material of the bag, and then the color of the bag. And because of those two changes, he ordered a whole container of products, that one order came in and um, his entire listing just collapsed. He got, the listing got suspended because everybody was complaining. Um, his, it was his top seller, so his account were, was on the verge of suspension. Um, that brand, um, he was selling tens of millions of dollars a year in that, for that, those travel bags, and that brand does not exist today after that order. Um, so that kind of stuff like happens all the time. It's really sad to hear, and you know, unfortunately, we hear that you know, being on this side of the table. But um, color consistency is huge. Like even um, you know, like Apple, for example, right? Like we have this like Apple charger here conveniently. Uh, but um, this is um, white, you know, and uh, Apple actually runs into issues where they have, um, you know, they, they wipe from the chargers, the wipe from the AirPods, the wipe from the cables. They all want to make sure the white is the same. And uh, you might think, hey, you know, I have a Pantone color or something like that, you know, Pantone number for the color that I use in my product. The challenges with like Pantone numbers is that you can have XYZ Pantone number, but you know, once it's processed, once there's a texture on there, once it goes through a machine, um, the raw materials might be the correct Pantone number, but when the final product comes in, it could be like a small shade different or just feel different or look different. And you can't tell that from the Pantone. Like you'll literally put the Pantone next to it and you'll be like, well, this looks similar, but I think it's right, you know? So it's really important to actually, um, one of those things that you should be doing with your suppliers is, um, we actually always recommend to have a reference sample um, with your supplier. And this is really good whether you do an inspection um, and also like just in general for your supplier. So the way that works is that you find a sample of the product that you like a lot and you approve of. Uh, you sign it all over. So it can't be, it's very clear this is the reference sample that's approved. You can put like a date, you can put your signature, put like approved or whatever. Um, and like write it in Sharpie all over the product so it's like very clear. And then literally send it to your factory, mail it there, and, you know, go to UPS, go to USPS, whatever mail carrier you want to use, and mail it to your supplier and tell them to keep it aside and say, hey, this is going to be for our inspections, but also this is also going to be for you. So every time you guys have an order, tell your production workers, your production line workers, or your whoever's managing this to actually look at the, what the reference sample is and make sure that the product is the same as the reference sample. So this is really helpful because when those production line workers turn over, which happens you know, every six months, years sometimes, um, when those you know, production employees, the managers, whatever, they turn over, or they forget your product, they're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of customers you know, every month. So it's very easy for them to forget what they're producing, who your product is, you know, things like that. They now have a reference sample that they know you're gonna hold them to and they can say, oh, wait, this is the product. Oh, right, this is the color, whatever. And then they can make sure that the product is good 
and compare it to that reference sample as it's produced. Um, so that helps a lot to kind of make sure that process is done right. And you can also, and you also have that for your inspector. So, you know, when we go do inspections, we will go check the reference sample and compare it to what the final product is. And you can get a lot of subjective details that you may not be able to translate in technical specs, like what is the Pantone number? Cool, you know, it gets you 99% of the way there, but that extra 5% or a few percentage points or whatever, 1%, you know, you can get that there with the reference sample. Um, so it's, and then you can see, okay, hey, you know, is the leather, the quality the same? Is the feel the same? Is the texture the same? You know, and you can get the subjective details that you normally can't get. And as long as it's signed and, you know, things like that, when you get the photos, you're like, all right, this is the right unit that was used in the comparison. And that can be, you know, oftentimes your sales agent will be the one that will store it in their office for you. That's a great tip. We have a question going back to the warranty. You know, you're no good if you don't have a warranty. Someone asks, should you give a one year, like two year lifetime? Like what's the best practice on warranty? I guess it yeah. depends on category, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's very dependent on categories, dependent on your competition. There's also a, um, like a compliance piece to it. So if you go to like California, certain products, like they require a you know, certain warranty. Um, the EU is really bad. So they'll actually like, I think like Apple, don't quote me on this, but like Apple for their iPhones, they can give like a one year warranty in the States, but in the EU, they have to give like a two or three year warranty um, in certain places. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, so I could be wrong there, but I know for a fact, EU is a lot stricter on warranties. So depending on like where you're selling the products and you know the type of product you're selling in the industry, um, you will have to order, you know, do a warranty accordingly. Uh, but I mean, the best practice is like, you know, at the end of the day, this is business. <laughs> so your, your your best practice is do the least possible that allows you to sell the products, right? So if you're, you know, if your product, uh, you can sell it, you know, with a one year warranty, um, there's no reason to offer a two or three year warranty. It just increases your costs and uh, increases your risk. And uh, that's not ideal. But you know, if you need a longer warranty to sell your product, then you know consider that. And but you know, if you do offer that warranty, do consider the risk, especially if it's like a normal wear and tear product, right? Then um, you know those warranties are going to be um, you know concerning. But uh, it also depends on the strength of the warranty, right? Like, do you want to order? Do you want to provide a warranty that is very comprehensive, or do you want to provide a warranty that's like limited in a lot of ways? And most warranties, you know, they'll say lifetime warranty, but they'll be like it's lifetime for manufacturing defects. So basically like, is there so something that's gonna go wrong that's a manufacturing defect, or is it like you just broke it because you used it too hard and that's not covered, right? So things like that are also to be considered, but um, ultimately, I mean, you just wanna do what's best for the business. So if you find that offering a lifetime warranty increases your sales 20%, you can split test it. You can be like, all right, well, maybe it's worth it, right? Otherwise it's a one-year warranty or a two-year warranty or you know, whatever warranty is necessary, you know, think about it that way. And also a lot of sellers or a lot of buyers now on Amazon, uh, again, it depends on the category, but like oftentimes when I'm buying something on Amazon, I'm not thinking about a warranty, right? So like, you know, you don't even need to put a warranty on there. <laughs> you know, you could, you could just try not doing that and see what happens. The best practice is one, what do you have to do to be compliant? And then two, what are your competitors doing? You know, because if your competitors have a two-year warranty and they're selling like way more than you are, then maybe you want to think about a two-year warranty. But, and I know a lot of times I pass up the warranty, like then not so much on Amazon because it just comes with it. But like if I'm at Lowe's or Home Depot or someplace that and you scan a certain thing that's got a warranty on it, it'll pop up on the screen and it'll like, do you want this $9, you know, one-year warranty? And usually I just like, no, let me scan the next thing. So that's probably as I break stuff to my detriment. But I think is only as much warranty as you have to is probably a good practice. Exactly. Yeah, I know that that makes a lot of sense. So let's go back to product reviews. So you've got this reviews analyzer and we're not gonna talk about how to get more product reviews because that's a whole nother conversation, that's but cool how do you like what is the I haven't looked at I just I just today I was today years old when I found out about your reviews analyzer so I'm going to take a look at that real quick but what do you do in the instance of positive reviews I mean I know that you said that's a real nice thing to tell your manufacturer about hey like this is wrong let's fix this but hey we got props on this but 
what else can you do with positive reviews to optimize to make your product even better yeah that's a good question um i think there's like there's always going to be small things in the product that you can always improve so for example um, i was talking with the seller the the other week um who's like does a lot of clothes and apparel and things like that and like stuff that has like more designs and design oriented you know with like fabrics and stuff and uh, he gets a lot of reviews and um, his product is well rated but what he does is like every quarter or every six months you know he tries to have it on a cycle the shorter the cycle the better um, he'll go through all the reviews from the last you know three months or whatever and uh, he'll actually take a look and say okay hey you know we had a lot of customers that said the size is fantastic but they'd appreciate it if it's a little bit bigger, right? And then you can take that and say, okay, hey, let's make the size, the product a little bit bigger. Let's make the design a little bit sharper, right? So there's always like product improvements that will happen. Um, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Like if you take a look at like any consumer brand company like Procter & Gamble or Apple or, you know, any company that sells products, they do this. Like, you know, you can end up buying the same model MacBook from January and you know buy the same MacBook in July. It's the same model technically, but it's different like model number because you know it's, even though it's the same product, it's like and they haven't released an update. They've made a lot of internal changes, tweaks. You know they've made some improvements. So you know it's always good to be making improvements and then just like understanding what those improvements are through the reviews. I think that I, you can also get ideas for enhancements and add-ons too. I was talking to somebody at a conference, it was forever ago, but he sold some sort of tool and a bunch of the reviews said, Gio really wish this came with gloves. So he added gloves to this tool because I guess it gave you blisters on your hands and his sales like tripled or quadrupled or something like that. So you can get ideas for product enhancements too. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a really good point. Actually, um, another really key thing here is you can actually um, look at the frequently bought with products, right? If you want to look for add-ons, so it's like, oh, this product is frequently bought with this, 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 and maybe whatever else. Those are great insights to kind of understand, you know, a maybe some products you could expand to with your brand, and then b, you know, some add-ons with um, you know what your product should be, you know, sold with. Um, so you can create a set or, or something like that with those frequently used items. Oh, remember the days of bundles? That was the that was the hot like that was the hot trend word in like 2016. It was like, yeah, create bundles and that will differentiate. But that was in the world of like, you know, what the majority resellers and not as many brands on Amazon. But I remember everybody wanted to talk about product bundling back then. You can still bundle as a brand and you should, but uh it's just a breath of fresh air we did have a question about listing optimization and it occurs to me that the title of this might have been a little misleading because we're actually talking about optimizing your products themselves that is what mobley is great at helping you do but i'm sure you run into a lot of brands that say my listing isn't converting there's something wrong with my product and you've got to probably set them straight some of the time because there might not be anything wrong with their product but there's plenty wrong with their, their listing so do you have any insight into that and some best practices you can share yeah so i wouldn't be the best person uh, to talk to you about that but that said uh when it comes to like optimizing your listings what we've heard work from customers really really well is using split testing um so you know how i was saying like about split testing warranties things like that Split testing is an amazing thing that uh, technology has allowed us to do so i would highly recommend split testing as many factors as possible this is something we did on our products as well when i was selling on amazon uh so you know Take a look at PicFu and like some of these other companies that like do a lot of these uh, you know tests and then you know run those tests very rapidly and you know take a look at what images work, what products work, what bullet points work, what product features work. Um, so all those aspects are really good. Um, another thing that's really amazing um, is actually paid ads and not paid ads in the sense of like I want to get people to use paid ads to like actually go buy my product, which you know, obviously that would be great. Uh, but you can actually use paid ads to rapidly test messaging um, as well. So you can actually target paid ads if you have like um, a lookalike audience for customers who have bought your products before. It's a little more difficult if you're selling on Amazon. But uh, in general, like if you can target some of your customers, you can actually run an ad and say, hey, you know, bullet point A, bullet point B, put it into your graphic and then literally run that ad to the same audience and see if one gets more clicks or one gets more interest. And then you can say, okay, hey, you know, maybe this performs better. 
Um, so paid ads is actually really good. I attended a, um, a talk um, uh, about a year or two ago. Um, so it might be uh, a little bit older now, but it was with the Harmon brothers. And um, the Harmon brothers were the guys that did the, um, um, it's actually, you, it was in your guys' office in, uh, in Boston, right? The, yeah. Uh, I remember that, yeah. And um, twenty one. That was the seller velocity with Chris McCabe, right? Right, right, yeah. And um, we had one of the Harmon brothers there, and he was giving some crazy insights. And like the Harmon brothers, for you, you guys that are listening, they're the guys that started like uh, the Papuri, the Squatty Potty, um, Purple Mattress. Like they're the guys that came up with all of those crazy ads, and they built so many massive companies off that. And they had some of the most amazing frameworks for launching ads that I've ever heard of and uh, obviously they work <laughs> because they've they've done a very very good job uh, with making sure those will do work uh, but one of the biggest ways they use paid ads initially is they would not just go run it and max it out immediately they would use it strategically to test out the messaging and see what works what doesn't work what gets clicks what doesn't and then after they get all that wrap it all up put it into a nice um, you know couple of you know series of ads and then start going at scale with that. So it was, it was really, really, really good at analyzing the data from your ad sets. Yeah. So I put right. a top link to take a metric. There are people asking if I can put your LinkedIn link in the chat. Is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. I can drop it in. Yeah, I don't think you can chat to everybody. So I'm going to give this to everybody. So that's how you find Sajag. But somebody did also ask who's the very best product inspector. Um, where was that? The best oh, yeah. inventory inspector in China and how much should you pay those companies? So talk to him about that because <laughs> that's what they do. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about that. I think one of the biggest things is like a lot of people look at QC and they see like such as wide variance. They're like, oh, I can get an inspection for a hundred bucks. I can get an inspection for more, right? Like I should just go with the cheapest guy, right? And like they think about inspections as like kind of a commodity. And the challenge with that is that, um, you know, A, when it comes down to the inspection, um, there's a few parts to it. First of all, the inspection itself, you want to make sure your inspector is actually trained. They have, you know, the right, you know, they're actually getting paid well enough. They have a salary, they have benefits, whatever. Um, so that way, you know, they're not going in and they're a contractor that just like goes in and spends two hours at your factory. And it's like, yeah, like everything looks great. And they don't really care about their job. Um, so when it comes down to an inspection, at the end of the day, it's not even like the uh, typical inspection, like with Mobley, for example, costs three hundred and two dollars a mandate. A lot of inspections just take a day. Um, some take more service days, but for most you know, inspections, it'll pay, take about a day. Uh, it depends on really the size and complexity of your order. Uh, but the way that you should be looking at inspections is that it's first of all something you should be doing on all of your orders. Um, and the reason for that is also that your inspection is actually built into your cost of goods sold. So if your order is like $10,000 or, you know, with all your freight included, you know, your $302 inspection is like barely like two, 3% on your COGS. And, you know, if you have an order that's 25 or 50 or a hundred thousand dollars, you know, we're talking like you know, basically nothing on your COGS. It's such a negligible amount. Um, it's much better to get an inspection that truly checks your products and makes sure that, you know, your products are good. And uh, there's two parts of an inspection. 50% of it is setup, 50% of it is execution. So the execution part, obviously you want to work with a really good company. You want to make sure that, you know, the inspector goes to the factory and they're actually doing the job that they're supposed to do. But 50% of it is the setup. So a lot of times you'll go to an inspection company and, you know, 99% of the time they'll literally have three questions. And it'll be like, what's your name? What's your email? What's your factory? What's your product? And then like any additional notes and then like submit. It'll be like, okay, pay us for your inspection. Uh, but, you know, when you put stuff like that into like, you know, any additional notes, the guy who's actually going and doing the inspection doesn't really read any of that. There's no process in place to actually make sure your inspection is done right. So what you want to be looking for when you're doing an inspection, whether you work with Mobley or not, and we make it really easy and convenient to do that. Well, actually, you can log into our platform, add all your products, and then just literally hit book QC and enter the number of units every shipment. We make it very easy and convenient. But um, you want to make sure they're checking your labeling. You want to make sure they're looking at UPC codes, your FN SKU labels. They're scanning those to make sure those actually scan. We've had issues where those don't scan and then, you know, get to Amazon, you have a huge problem. 
Uh, so you want to make sure they're checking the labeling, the packaging, the product. Um, there's an opportunity and a place in the booking system to actually add tests and checks and visual defects and things like that. So you'll see that in the Mobly platform because we actually have a process around it. So you can put in all your tests and checks and things like that, and we'll actually help you build that checklist as well. We have a team of quality engineers on the back end. So when you submit your inspection based on your product and your recs and your specs, we'll actually recommend some checklist items for you. Uh, when you go through the process, um, it'll go through that entire process with you. And at the end of it, you know, we'll send an inspector, we'll make sure the inspection was done right. And then you get that report to make sure that, hey, everything was done right. So there's a, a lot of different aspects. There's also drop tests, carton checks, packaging checks. Um, so you want to make sure you've defined specs for all of that. And if you haven't defined those specs or it's just one box that says any additional notes, 99% of the time your inspector is just going there. He's like, yeah, these look good sounds good and then it's like what is even the point of doing an inspection you're still going to get past inspections and then still get your bad products that are mislabeled or have other issues so um yeah so at the end of the day an inspection doesn't really cost that much um get it done right and you know protect your brand on amazon it's just like it's not worth it to risk like half a star or a star over saving 100 bucks um and, and ending up with a much worse inspection it really comes down to the stars, and that's a big concern. I think I've gotten enough questions about product reviews in this that I think it's time to do another webinar on product reviews. The last one was a whole year ago, so there's yeah. new stuff now. But um, okay, so I've put how to how to connect on LinkedIn into the chat. I put the listing. I'm gonna put your main website into the chat too because we have people asking about that. And then what I do is I take the chat and I take all the links I posted in the chat and I also put them in your replay email that you'll get. And they'll also be on uh, the Take a Metrics website under resources, webinars, a little write up and all of the relevant show notes will be there too. If this is your first rodeo with the Take a Metrics webinar, if it's not, then you've heard this all before and you're horribly, horribly bored of me. But there is that and I'll put it in the chat too. Chat. All right, this is the first webinar we've done since like 2021, I think. Yeah, no, it's been a while. It's uh, it's good to be on and kind of talk through some of the new stuff that's been coming out. Yeah, well, so if anybody has got questions, if anybody has needs in terms of talking to their factories, if actually, in, don't you also help people find factories if they are, if their factory like shuts down or they're looking to manufacture a new product or do you not so much do that? Yeah, so we don't really do that as far as like helping customers find factories, but what's actually really interesting is uh, checking to make sure factories are not shutting down. Um, there's actually a huge issue going on in China right now. So if you're manufacturing in China, um, it's kind of brushed under the rug because a no media publication wants to cover it. Uh, that's mainstream because it risks them, you know, when they they have any people in China or any countries that are you know heavily influenced by China. Uh, but uh, a lot of factories in China are actually dealing with a lot of issues. Their economy is like kind of collapsing in on itself right now. So like some factory owners uh, have actually like they're receiving um, actually subsidies from the government because their order volumes are so low right now that they're literally about to lay off staff. And the government has intervened and said, hey, don't lay off any of your staff. We'll give you we'll allow you to cut their salaries by 30 percent and we'll give you additional subsidies and tax credits to make sure that you're not laying anyone off. So there are like a lot of like economic problems right now happening in China. So um, if you have a factory there, you should probably be kind of like a little extra cautious and, and kind of make sure things are going well. Um, and that's like, it, it's a tricky kind of balance because it's hard to know what's happening. And, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a little difficult, but there are like actually like very like big things happening right now. And um, Mexico has now become like America's largest trading partner. So like, there's a lot of companies and a lot of foreign direct investment that's leaving China and that's actually creating a lot of issues for their economy. Uh, so it's really interesting. They, they shut down um, actually a, um, so there are a lot of larger companies. They actually used a um, intelligence agency, like a, they use intelligence companies. So say for example, I'm working with a new supplier in China. Some of these largest enterprises, they will hire like private investigators that go and investigate the, um, you know, the factories and suppliers to work with, check their financials, audits, and, you know, track records to make sure nothing's going to go wrong. And um, 
a lot of those, uh, one of those companies, uh, major international firm used by a lot of the Fortune 500, um, actually got their offices raided in China. So because of a, a new national security law and just for doing like day-to-day -day normal business. Um, so China's basically come in and said, hey, we don't want you to be doing DD on our companies, but we also want your money. And uh, we're also like, you know, having economic issues. So it, it's created like a whole storm. Um, so it, it's uh, it's more important than ever to just be on top of your stuff. And otherwise, um, you know, you're, and maybe find like another supplier uh, that can produce your products uh, just in case anything goes wrong. That's great. That's great advice. Um, say your company name because I keep telling someone it and he keeps asking again. Yeah, absolutely. It's called Movly, um, M-O-V-L-E-Y.com. Uh, so uh, yeah, and you can also look at the um, the webinar signup link. Our logo is there. So uh, it's just Movly.com, uh, M-O-V-L-E-Y.com. And it's super simple. Just say create an account and we'll load up all your products. and It'll be super easy. And definitely, is that um, Reviews Analyzer free? Yeah, it's completely free. Uh, you can just go on our <laughs> website. <laughs> pay, uh, a lot of uh, API fees for OpenAI for that. But uh, yeah, you can just go in and you can just drop your ASIN and um, give it like a few minutes. It, it downloads, as I said, five pages of reviews, like 50 pages and processes it. So it takes like a minute or two to run. Uh, but yeah, just drop your ASIN in there, hit uh, submit. Um, any product you want, your ASIN, your friend's ASIN, your competitor's ASIN, um, and you can just literally get a full analysis immediately, like uh, within a minute or two. That's awesome. Well, this couldn't have been any more fun if we had tried, I think. Thanks to everybody for hanging out with us. We had over 30 people that hung with us for this whole thing. If you were looking for listing optimization, I will totally do content on that. Just email me, ldowning at takeometrics.com. If you need help with your advertising, please click that Let's Talk link in the chat because we also will do a free opportunity analyzer for you for Amazon or Walmart and show you all the places you could be advertising that you, sh you know, and all the ways you could be advertising. And we also um, will let you try out Flywheel 2.0 for free. So don't miss out on that, even though we didn't talk about advertising today. And you should go to movley.com, M-O-V-L-E-Y.com, and you can get started with these guys as they help you optimize your products um, so that you do not get any kind of star reduction on your listings. Yeah, thanks so much, Liz. Uh, thanks for having me on. And by the way, you know, we use Tico Metrics uh, when I was running my brand, and I only have great things to say. Uh, so highly recommend checking them out. We love to hear that. And I guess, what's the next conference you're going to? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think I'm trying to go to Accelerate in uh, in uh, Seattle. So I'm trying to, so, trying to go for Yeah, it. that's another thing I should put. Okay, in the show notes, y'all, I've got a link um, to buy tickets for Accelerate. Tickets are selling super fast to that. But Amazon's own seller conference in Seattle um, in September, September 12th through the 14th. And it's like such a good conference. And also the Space Needle Party is lit. So hopefully we'll see you there, but I'll put a link in that that will help you guys get to that conference too. And I will see you there and we'll see you all next time. Um, keep an eye on your emails for future webinars. We're gonna probably be doing at least one a month from here on and make sure you hit up Movly for all of your inspection needs. Thanks everyone. Awesome, thanks everybody, take care.